Good afternoon, everyone. Can I have a thumbs up to see that people can hear me okay? Hopefully people can hear me. Um, thank you very much for joining us. My name is Gillian Harkness and I'm a director in the third sector team at Burnus Paul. I'm going to start with the slightly mundane housekeeping rules. Unbelievably, housekeeping is a thing for webinars. You have all been somewhat unceremoniously placed on mute. That's just so that we can avoid hearing washing machines, dogs, children. Um, apologies in advance, there is a high degree of probability that my children will interrupt this at some point because we only have Wi-Fi in one room. So apologies in advance for that. Please do participate though via the WebEx chat function. The lovely Rona McAdam, who's a senior solicitor in our team, is going to be monitoring your questions on that. And after each section of today's webinar, she'll put those questions to the speaker. If there are very specific questions, i.e. specific to your organisation, we might not be able to answer those today, but we will try our best to follow up on you with those. I'm also bound to tell you that today's webinar is being recorded just to make it available to people who weren't able to join live. And if you'd like some more information on that, you can refer to the privacy policy on the Burnus Paul website. Please also check out our website because we have a coronavirus hub page which has got loads and loads of useful information on different topics. Um, so please do have a look at that. And finally, if everything goes wrong and the technology doesn't work, we will be in touch and we'll reconvene. So this is the third webinar that I've been involved in since the lockdown. And the first one I did was in the media aftermath of Boris telling us all that we had to stay at home. And at that point in time, everything felt very raw very much a short, sharp shock. I would say that now, probably all of us, at least in our individual personal lives, are getting into some kind of routine, finding, finding a bit of a rhythm and a way of coping with things. And my uh, means of escaping from the horrors of homeschooling is indulging in the BBC's adaptation of Sally Rooney's Normal People, which is available on iPlayer just now. It's so, so good, uh, dare I say it, better than actually the, the book, the television adaptation. And without giving away spoilers, it is about very normal people trying to find their way through life, trying to navigate the trials and tribulations of their teens and 20s, and trying to work out where they go from here and feeling very, very unsure in themselves. And speaking for myself, uh, being involved in the charity sector, that's how I feel at the moment. And I think if you are involved in the senior management team of a charity, or if like me and Stephen, who's speaking later, you're on the board of a charity in a voluntary capacity, it feels as if we've got this Herculean endeavor ahead of us to try and find our way through whatever the next phase looks like um, following the pandemic. And Stephen and I are not arrogant enough to <laughs> try and give the answers to that today because by goodness we don't know either but the aim of the session is really to try and give you some of our thoughts around governance in the third sector to assist you with the decision making that you will be called upon to do within the, the next little the next little while so with that in mind I'm going to hand over to Stephen Phillips who is the head of our third sector team and he is going to start with the joyful subject that is wrongful trading. So over to you, please, Stephen. Thanks. Thanks so much, Gillian. Um, as Gillian says, this is a time of serious stress for boards um, sitting on third sector organisations. And for those sitting on a board uh, of a third sector organisation, which takes the form of a limited company, there is an additional worry in the form of the wrongful trading provisions of the Insolvency Act. And we've had a number of questions from directors um, sitting on charitable companies and other third sector companies around the potential um, for them incurring personal liability if things uh, go badly. And I think for both Gillian and myself, sitting in a voluntary capacity on the, on the charity boards that we do, it's also a personal matter for us so we do kind of understand the angst and, and, and issues around all of that. You're trying to do the best uh, for, 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 for the company in keeping it going through very, very difficult times and yet at the back of your mind is the potential 
for the spotlight to be turned on you personally, and at least in theory, um, a situation where you might have to shell out from your own personal funds um, towards the, 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 the company's debts, which is not a great prospect. So against the background of that, we thought it might be useful just to go through um, in a little bit more detail what the wrongful provisions actually say. Um, then talk a bit about you know what that means in practice, particularly in the kind of uh, context that that, that that we're dealing with here, and then finally touch on the implications of the announcement by the UK Business Secretary, which is about a month ago now, that the wrongful trading provisions were to be suspended retrospectively as from 1st March. Um, I suppose just cutting to that last bit. First, um, I don't think that we can responsibly just take that announcement at its face value and disregard wrongful trading. I think it is important that we're all aware of, 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 of what that means, but it does represent a comfort at the end of all of this that the already low likelihood of being caught under wrongful trading will be lower still um, on the back of whatever amendments to legislation emerge. Um, on the back of that announcement. So, cutting to the chase, the bottom line in relation to the wrongful trading provisions, and with apologies for those that have maybe heard me saying this before or heard it otherwise in the context of, of training sessions, is that the court can, on the application of a liquidator, um, order a director to make a contribution out of their own personal assets towards the company's debts if the company has gone into insolvent liquidation. And the key test in relation to that is whether the director knew or ought reasonably to have concluded at some point before the company did go bust um, that there was no reasonable prospect of avoiding insolvent liquidation. So a lovely lawyer's double negative there. The test is at some point before the company went bust, should you have known um, that there was really no chance of pulling through? And as from that point, did you do what the legislation would expect you to do, which is to take all necessary steps to um, minimise further loss to credit, as that normally means closing the, the thing down and um, bringing in the vultures uh, to pick over what remains and see what can be done to satisfy a creditor's claims. Um, important element of that is, is that it's not just about what you knew, it's what you ought reasonably to have known and what you ought reasonably to have concluded. And so not being involved in the decisions around um, what should happen in a situation of financial crisis is a bad place to be. Um, also, taking no time or not taking the necessary time to understand the financial position and drill into it and to check what the, the negative factors were out there. Again, not a good place to, to be because the court will apply the test of another bit of great legalese, a reasonably diligent person, and they'll take into account um, any particular qualifications or, or experience that you might personally have. So if you're a retired chartered accountant, that is likely to increase what's expected of you. Plus, they will take into account any particular function that you perform in relation to the company. So if, for example, you sit in the audit committee, the likelihood is that that again will increase um, what the law would expect you to know and the kinds of uh, decisions that they would expect you to make in these, in these circumstances. Um, so that's what wrongful trading says uh, in, in, in terms of the, 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 the legal position. At a practical level, what does it mean in this particular circumstance? Well, it means that you absolutely do, uh, as a board, need to drill into the, all the ins and outs of the challenges that are facing the organisation, but also the positive aspects. And the use of the terminology reasonable prospect makes it clear that it doesn't need to be certain that you're going to pull through, but it does need to be a reasonable prospect, in other words, something more than just a kind of faint hope. And there is case law that just backs that up, that some kind of idea that someone's going to bail you out without clearly identifying who that party is and how that's going to pan out is 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 really not 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 going to be enough. Um, so there needs to be a reasonable prospect of pulling through. Otherwise, you are at least potentially um, in the frame. Um, important. As we mentioned, that all the directors do um, 
take a very close interest, that actually agonise over it and make sure that, they, they're, that, that they're taking informed um, decisions. Um, but also, I suppose, um, looking at this from a wider perspective, it's also important that directors don't over, overstate the, the risk associated with wrongful trading. Um, and take what some might see as the easy way out by it's simply dropping uh, the company uh, into into the into liquidation. Um, the reality is, leaving aside the current um, unprecedented uh, circumstances, um, the number of cases where directors have been directly um, in the frame in relation to wrongful trading is minuscule by reference to company liquidations in general. And that's not talking about third sector organisations, it's talking about um, companies right across uh, the, the, the private sector. Um, so, um, you know, it is important to be aware of the principle, but also to understand that the risk at a practical level is, is, is pretty, pretty remote. But the fact that it's there influences behaviour. And um, in particular in the current climate where there is a significant push towards trying as best we can to keep the economy afloat. And in a third sector context, um, that push towards keeping the good work that charities and other third sector organisations do to keep that going. Again, it would be really unfortunate if boards take a defensive approach looking to the, the risk, remote risk, of personal liability by not making every effort to navigate a way through um, for their organisation. And that's the background to the UK Business Secretary's announcement. It was that suggestion that actually, and obviously he was thinking primarily about the private sector, if boards of directors are intimidated by wrongful trading into dropping the companies, then the effect of that in terms of um, unemployment and in terms of the overall economy would be absolutely disastrous. Um, and hence the announcement that there would be some form of suspension of wrongful trading provisions and that this would be effective as from 1st March. So the announcement was made um, at the end of March or towards the end of March, been a month. We haven't actually seen the detail of that. We don't yet know whether it's going to be a full suspension or whether there may be certain qualifications around all of that. For example, there could have been uh, companies already in financial difficulty before COVID-19 who arguably, you know, may be questionable whether the directors should be let off the hook. And equally, once we emerge from the worst of COVID-19, um, there may be an aspect to which um, companies may still be struggling and the potential for being caught under wrongful trading may still exist. So I suppose our recommendation at the moment, and we like to make kind of practical recommendations, I suppose is, you know, first of all, be aware of what the wrongful trading provisions require you to do as a director. Um, be sensible in evaluating the level of real risk as distinct from the theoretical exposure that, that's there, which may sound strange coming from a lawyer. And I suppose thirdly, take comfort from the fact that in the current environment, the government push is towards keeping going and therefore to some extent erring on the side of an over-optimistic view of what reasonable prospect of avoiding insolvent liquidation means. And also bearing in mind that the question of whether an award is made in response to the application for the liquidator against individual directors is always at the discretion of the court. And it remains open, leaving all of that aside, for the court to say, OK, but these were incredibly difficult circumstances. If, you know, in a normal setting, we'd have been making uh, an order for a contribution here, but given the nature of what was going on round about you, fine, we're not going to do that. And or, and there's only been a hint of this in one particular case, and or saying you're sitting on the board of a third sector organisation if it's a charity particularly, you're not getting any remuneration from being paid as a director. Therefore, again, we don't think it's appropriate that you should, making a, you should be making a contribution. So I hope that's helpful um, in giving an over, overview of the, of the wrongful trading provisions, but also I think importantly bringing out some of the kind of practical implications um, of, of, of that particular in the current environment. I'll pause there and see whether or not there are any questions that people have 
and posted that we could usefully cover off before I move on to the next topic. Uh, no, there's no questions now. Fantastic. Thanks very much. Uh, again, uh, you know, with all of these things, if people want to post a, a later date or uh, sorry, a later uh, stage in the webinar or even just post directly uh, to, to Bernus Paul, we're happy to, to, to help. We're very keen in the current uh, climate um, to, to, to help as, as far as we can apply our technical expertise. Um, the other uh, topic that I was going to be looking at, again, on the basis that's generated quite a number of um, questions, is around meetings and particularly the ins and outs from a technical perspective uh, around holding meetings remotely. Um, so I suppose the starting point in relation to that and is, is, is I suppose ties in with a general theme, which is one, you know, be aware of what the legal technicalities are, not surprisingly, but also bear in mind that there are a whole range of other risks out there. And the kind of advice that we give routinely, leaving aside current circumstances to clients, we acknowledge that you know, being um, Having a zero risk position in relation to legal niceties might mean that you're taking on significant other risks which outweigh, you know, potentially uh, or ought to outweigh um, taking a kind of more, more pragmatic approach. And to me, for example, a zero risk basis in terms of meetings might involve exposing people to the kinds of um, health risks, which I think in the current environment are utterly unacceptable, giving, you know, leaving aside uh, any of the, the, the guidance uh, and, and, and other stuff out there. So yeah, you know, if you're weighing up the possibility that someone might raise a question mark in relation to some very, very detailed aspect of um, procedural requirement as against the implications of particularly vulnerable people being exposed to you know, uh, in, infection risk, well, you know, personally, I know exactly where, where I would go um, on that. Um, so on to the, 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 the topic proper in terms of virtual meetings, um, probably best to look at it in two categories, one board meetings um, and the other uh, meetings of members of what we lawyers would call general meetings. Um, as far as board meetings are concerned, um, most modern articles of association will include a provision saying that you that directors or other board members can participate in board meetings um, by use of video conferencing facilities. Nobody uses big terms like Skype um, or Zoom, um, um, or by way of a, a telephone conference or, or similar equipment is the way it's normally phrased. And if that is there, you're, 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 you're probably fine. Sometimes, depending on the detail of how that's worded, there may be a little bit of a question mark about whether or not someone participating in that way is part of the quorum. So, you know, if your quorum is five um, directors or five, uh, in the case of a ski or five charity trustees, is someone joining by phone? Can you can you legitimately um, count them uh, in the quorum? But that's just, a, 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 I suppose, a matter of the detail. Uh, drafting. The other kind of more fundamental question is um, what if there's nothing along those lines within your articles of association or your Bencom rules or your or your skill constitution? And um, this is the kind of area where the, the, the law kind of runs out in the sense that there is no specific um, decided reported court case where a judge has said, well, you know, it's fine to carry on even if there's nothing in the articles to have a fully remote um, meeting. Um, our own view of it, for what it's worth, and we have to say, you know, it comes with a caveat uh, that it, it is untested, that's not authoritative. Our own view is that if you look at what the essence of a board meeting is, if people can all hear what everybody else is saying, and if they can make their views known and everybody else hears what they are saying, um, kind of, you got a meeting. If you think of what a board meeting is meant to do, you know, kind, what are you missing out? You don't need to actually um, 
necessarily see somebody's face, although that may be helpful to see the body language. You don't necessarily have to kind of smell their perfume. <laughs> um, to, you know, kind of what's different, I, I would be saying. Um, be, you know, to, I would say perfume rather than BO, obviously. Um, you know, what, 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 what makes what a physical meeting more of a meeting, if you think of what meetings are for, uh, from a governance point of view, um, as compared with um, a, a remote meeting, you know, where it's where it's working property and properly and everybody's there. So that that certainly would be our our recommendation. Um, other possibilities would be um, using a written resolution procedure. So again, many articles of association and many uh, SKU constitutions will allow for the possibility that those sitting in the board can make a decision by um, either signing a single bit of paper. Uh, agreeing to a particular formal um, decision, um, or by sending in an email saying that they agree to it. Um, normally, however, check, your, check the detail of the wording, but normally that will be all of the board members would need to participate in that and agree, um, not just a majority. So that may be a little bit of a hurdle. People ask also, well, what about just swapping emails? Um, and again, there's a bit of a kind of pragmatic aspect to this. If you know it's very, very clear from the emails that everybody is in agreement with that particular proposal, and it would just be a waste of time and/or cause difficulties to um, you know set up a, a Skype or whatever, and there may be difficulties. People may have you know bad Wi-Fi connection, etc. Well, yeah, kind of. But I suppose we would always recommend that at the end of that email chain. That someone puts together, it could be the whoever is quotes chairing that um, email discussion, if we put it that way, um, sets out in paper what they regard the decision as, and for all those participating to confirm that that is the decision, so that it's absolutely clear what, what, what what's involved in that, um, and that arguably creates the benefit of a kind of email chain to show in the lead up to that that the directors or other board members of a different type of Non company, um, were properly drilling into the ins and outs of various other other uh, other options because um, there's an aspect of this which I think we, we 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 need to bear in mind. Although Oscar has said that they will be pragmatic and proportionate in relation to um, people possibly departing from the details of constitutions and how they approach some of these things, and that's that's fine. Do bear in mind that the kinds of decisions that some boards are taking in the current environment are absolutely fundamental and absolutely critical. So decisions about um, moving on, you know, taking uh, advantage of the uh, job retention scheme, decisions about you know, redundancies, decisions about how they deal with certain um, with reserves, how they deal with certain funding streams, etc., could be the subject of inquiry. Let's put it that way at a future date. And in those circumstances, it could be unhelpful that all you have by way of paper trail instead of a conventional board minute is, um, you know, a, a, a one paragraph thing outlining what the final decision was. So sometimes an email trail um, or some kind of record of discussions um, leading up to that could be quite important. And I suppose just in case anyone maybe missed this aspect, if you're having a virtual board meeting, um, do keep minutes of that as a board meeting um, and record it in the same kind of detail as you would have if it had been um, people sitting around sitting around the same um, the same table. Um, okay, so that's all I was really going to tackle in terms of uh, board minutes. Again, if the uh, board meetings rather um, run remotely, if they're or by way of written resolution. If there are other questions around that, again, we can we can pick up on them. Um, the other um, topic uh, was was under general meetings, so an annual general meeting or another uh, meeting which involves members used to be called extraordinary general meetings. Um, I suppose it has to be recognised that the approach to meetings within that category, uh, as far as the legal principles uh, are concerned, has tended to be more rigorous. In the sense that um, procedural irregularities, such as having too short a period of notice, etc., do seem to have been taken quite seriously by by the courts. Um, there is a precedent um, for the uh, principle. 
that you can hold an AGM partly in one physical location and partly through people joining externally. Um, but in that particular case, um, it was clear that the main meeting was in one location and that the quorum requirements relating to that meeting were fully satisfied um, by the people physically in one place. And some of the guidance which um, we've seen um, from other sources and some of the content of what the UK Business Secretary had issued back at the end of March suggests that the kind of default would be that kind of a remote meeting. That is, you have a small grouping of people enough to meet your quorum requirements in one place and others joining remotely. It doesn't tackle the more fundamental question is what if everybody essentially is, 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 is joining remotely. Um, and Again, although we are promised some amendments to legislation to ease things so far as AGMs are concerned, I've got a little bit of a suspicion that those um, amendments will be focusing more on a situation where you have enough um, members to make up a quorum in one place and the rest joining remotely, whereas I think many third sector settings, we would be looking at a fully um, remote, remote meeting. And secondly, um, taking account of the fact that for most um, third sector organisations, the kinds of quorums that set in the, in the articles or constitution or rules will mean that you would need um, too many people um, to be present in one place to satisfy anything um, likely to emerge by way of you know, re relaxations around social distancing, etc. So um, I think we probably would be looking at fully remote meetings. Well, again, our view for what it's worth is that the importance of the AGM um, in a third sector uh, context is greater um, than it is in many private sector settings. Uh, and that the idea that people can throw in questions and um, hold the board to account and interrogate particular issues in the accounts that they um, have, have concerns with, et cetera, et cetera, and actually participate in a more proactive way in elections rather than just ticking a box. All these are quite important things um, and therefore um, probably I, a fully remote meeting that maximises participation is, 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 is kind of the way um, certainly we would be inclined to go. Having said that, um, we need to take account of the fact that there are barriers um, in terms of um, using IT, which I'm only too conscious of, in the kind of pre-internet generation. Um, and therefore, it is important that third sector boards do give some thought to how they could encourage participation for those who are less comfortable about using Skype or who don't have a decent Wi-Fi signal on a more basic level, etc. Um, and the answer to that is most commonly through the use of proxies, um, which is very well established in terms of legal principles and, and non-problematic from that point of view, just to make it clear um, that people understand how a proxy form could be used and that it could be sent in by email if that's useful for them or they could post it in and probably guiding them, perhaps, you know, formatting the form in a way in which they can actually tick a box to to indicate um, to their proxy how he or she should vote in relation to that particular resolution. And that way they essentially cast their vote um, at the outset. Never going to be idea because, ideal because they won't be hearing the debate in the context of the live um, meeting. Um, they won't be able to kind of feed in questions in a, on a live basis and so on and so forth. But nevertheless, um, it's a way in which those who who have difficulties um, in, in feeding in um, through, um, uh, you know, electronically, put it that way, um, can, can, can um, participate. And as I say, um, pr probably not surprisingly, I think the focus of the UK government's push on this kind of stuff is likely to be set primarily around PLCs, I would guess, and then beyond that, private sector, and probably not thinking too deeply about um, how third sector organisations view um, the AGM or indeed general meetings in general as a means of securing accountability to their community, uh, community of interest in the widest sense. Um, so, you know, the, the, it 
probably not surprising. I think that the kinds of approaches that certainly we're suggesting and which we're seeing our clients taking up um, may differ slightly from how um, some of these other, other commentators are, are viewing things. So that was all I was going to say about um, board meetings and uh, general meetings. Uh, again, a wee pause for questions. So there's no questions um, specifically in relation to the meetings. Um, there is a question about the specific question about the bankrupt, uh, Bankruptcy Scotland Act and the changes that are being um, brought into force. I think that's maybe something that we'll need to follow up on separately because it's quite specific. Um, but there is also another question. Um, what about trustees of unincorporated associations and trusts and the risk of personal liability when insolvent? Yep. Well, no, that's that, again, that's that's an interesting one round trusts and unincorporated associations. You kind of treat them separately in the context of trusts. Um, there is a pretty dominant principle of trust law that providing trustees have made it clear that they are entering into contracts, etc., solely in their capacity as trustee and not in an individual capacity, that what they are doing in the old jargon is binding the trust estate under their charge. In other words, they're committing the trust um, to meeting um, liabilities under that contract to the extent of the assets that the trust has at the point when the liability lands and that they don't have to dip into their own personal pockets to meet those debts. Um, it's not, however, entirely clear cut. Um, there is an old dusty case which said that that was all very well, but when the trustees are signing that contract, they are also deemed to warrant, i.e. guarantee to the other party or parties to the contract that the trust has or will have um, sufficient assets to meet the payments due under that contract. So clearly that suggests that in certain contexts a trustee might have liability even if they make it clear that they're contracting solely as trustee. Um, there is the other point, um, which is that limited liability entities were created um, to confer the benefit of limited liability. And uh, if limited liability attached to being uh, on a trust, kind of why would um, why would limited companies have been invented? There's also a point which is some kinds of liabilities don't arise through signing contracts, um, and therefore, um, you know, for example, a dangerous buildings notice is a kind of classic. Um, it becomes a statutory liability. The building happens to be owned by a trust. Does that mean the trustees can walk away? Um, again, the position is not entirely clear cut, but there's a, there's a, I think there is potential um, exposure there. In relation to unincorporated associations, um, those sitting in the management committee absolutely are in a position of potential uh, exposure. Again, the legal principles are not entirely clear cut, um, but they do point to the likelihood that if the proverbial hits the fan, i.e. there are debts or other liabilities that the unincorporated association is unable to meet out of its own resources, that um, a claim that the liability can ultimately be enforced against um, most likely the individual members of the management committee. Um, the one example of that was a classic photocopier lease um, had been signed by three office bearers and they made it very clear they were signing on behalf of the unincorporated association. Um, and the court said, well, you can sign on behalf of another human person. Uh, it's called agency, that's fine, and that person's liable. You can sign on behalf of a company because that's a legal person in the eyes of the law. It's, it exists as a, as a potential contracting party. Um, but you can't sign on behalf of a nothing, and for most legal purposes, an unincorporated association is a nothing, and therefore you must be taken to be personally liable. And those three office bearers were required to meet the outstanding payments due under that photocopier lease. So that's a kind of clear signal that in certain circumstances, the courts have held management committee members liable. Another case was an employment tribunal case down south, but same principles where the award was made against the unincorporated association. 
and it was held that those on the management committee at the time when the claim crystallised were liable personally to meet that claim and particularly galling because the employment law issue that had given rise to the claim had been largely caused by a person who was no longer on the management committee. So pretty upsetting from that point of view. So um, in a nutshell, sorry, usual lawyer's long answer, but short answer would be trust, probably okay, um, but with an element of potential risk, unincorporated association, absolutely scary times, I'm afraid. Um, having said that, there isn't a huge volume of cases where um, people in management committees of unincorporated associations are, are ultimately held um, liable, possibly because the law isn't 100% clear cut, possibly because pursuing individual people can be more of a hassle in this kind of a context than um, pursuing a body, um, and possibly because um, they may, in some cases, not be worth suing um, and or um, the creditor may just take pity on them. So um, there's not a huge volume, but it is unfortunately uh, an area of, uh, of you know, potential exposure. And just an aside, it was the issue of um, potential personal liability for those sitting on the management committee of charities um, that were under corporate association that was a major driver for the invention of the skill as a new legal form. And um, kind of late now to actually get off one uh, train and get onto the other. But you know, for charities um, that are unincorporated associations, the recommendation still remains that if you're involved in any kind of operation beyond something really pretty small scale, you should um, think seriously about moving um, to, a, to a scale as your legal form. It's great. A few other questions have come in now. Um, what are our views on streaming an AGM to a global or international membership or the recording of it and sending it to members that could not attend virtually? <laughs> well, I suppose uh, streaming as streaming in the sense of passive participation are we talking about by the those sort of watching it internationally? Not sure. Yeah. Um, so, uh, which I suppose ties in with the idea of you know you kind of plonk it in your website. Um, I, I, it, 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 you know, technically the AGM is happening um, at, at the end when it's happening, if you say what I mean, rather than those you know who are passively watching and listening in. I don't think they would be deemed to be present in that sense because you know the essence of being present at a meeting in the legal sense is that you are um, able to participate um, in the context of a members meeting, um, certainly through, through voting um, and probably possibly by actually being able to kind of um, drop in comments and so on, speak, speaking. Um, so I suspect that's, that's maybe the answer to that. There may be a GDPR and other kind of data protection issues in terms of people being identified and, and, and that being spread more widely, which is an area that I'm not qualified to comment on, I'm afraid. We can maybe follow up on that separately. Okay. Um, another question, if you have a, a board member who is shielding um, and also possibly doesn't have the IT capability to be able to um, participate in a, a virtual meeting, um, if you send paper documents um, to the explanation, ex explanations and keep in touch with that person to get their views and telephone conversations, is that sufficient um, to meet your governance requirements? I think that's that's a difficult one. I mean, um, the ideal solution would be to set up an arrangement whereby he or she is actually is able to kind of dial in to a wider conversation. Uh, you know, via kind of conference call arrangement, because um, the idea of a live debate and hearing other people's views, you know, could be important. Um, having said that, in the context of one particular Oscar investigation, this may or may not be a charity, but anyway, if it were, um, Oscar expressed the view that if a director in that particular case was unable to attend board meetings, then he or she should feed their views into the chair, and that would kind of count 
as meaning that they were to some extent fulfilling their duties as a charity trustee. So if you were focusing on Oscar's view of life, they would see that as kind of reasonably well down the path towards full participation in a board meeting from the point of view of charity trustee duties. Um, however, you know, Oscar is not the voice of company law <laughs> or um, Bencom legislation, so you know one can't say that necessarily that's how it would be viewed by reference to other legal principles. And I think the point remains that the essence of a meeting is is that it's live, and that there is that interchange of views, which is important. But as a Plan B approach, and if a conference call for whatever reason couldn't be set up with that particular person, then um, it would I think be seen as a way in which she, he or she would be able to demonstrate that, that to some extent done what they could to fulfil their duties. Okay, um, and just one more question just now. Um, if an organisation is to hold a Zoom meeting and meet the quorum requirements, what would the risks be or the methods by which these issues could be raised or come about, i.e. would it incur legal costs to the complainant? I think that's meaning with yes. how how would somebody yeah to raise raise a claim well that's a very very good point and and I suppose it it lies behind a number of these um issues that get raised with us you know at one level there's the legal principles at the other level is our own judgment and what we think is an appropriate kind of pragmatic solution and then there's a level of well what are the odds what's the likelihood of anyone actually raising a challenge and then even more so what exactly would be the route by which that challenge was raised. And the reality is that formal process in terms of somebody going to court is vanishingly low, extremely unlikely, and actually quite difficult from a, from a technical point of view, assuming the majority of the board are comfortable with what has been done. Um, and yes, you know, where are they going to get the funds to, um, to, to, to take that forward? Um, and also, what, ultimately, what view would a court take because um, I think in the current environment, there is a pretty strong likelihood that the court would say, well, guess what, guys, um, this was a breach of your constitution, or this was you know, irregular in whatever ways by reference to legal principles, but at unprecedented circumstances and what was the alternative? Um, because, um, and I suppose this is a point which, you know, which probably needs to be emphasized, um, the worst thing to do probably is to say, you know, we want to hold to the letter of the law in terms of how we conduct our meetings. We can't meet together in a room um, just now, therefore let's not have any board meetings. Absolutely not, because in a time of crisis, you need more be board meetings. You need as much participation as you can um, from those sitting on the board. So I think there's a, there's a, a, ve a very real possibility that a court, if very hypothetically it was ever decided by court, would say, well, do you know, in normal circumstances X, but um, we don't feel that this is, is appropriate, that there should be a remedy in this context. Stephen, could I just add to that, that um, there was one I was involved in a number of years ago where I think the complainant, as it were, it never went to court, but I think they had a misunderstanding of the company's house rule as a, a regulator and were threatening to, quoting sections of the Companies Act and threatening to go off to Companies House as a regulator. I mean, Companies House, broadly speaking, don't care, yeah. they're not interested. Um, they want to make sure you send your annual accounts in on time and things like that, but they really don't care about things like that, as compared with Oscar, who would take it seriously if someone were saying, oh, you've not complied with the provision of your constitution at the moment. Um, but the message that's coming through loud and clear from Oscar at the moment is proportionality, flexibility, and a recognition that these are very, very difficult times that we're in. Yep, absolutely. Okay. Conscious of time and that people may have a, a, a half past one deadline, so um, I'll hand to over to Gillian now. Thank you. If you pop yourself on mute, Stephen, thanks. I hope everyone can see me. I'm still looking small on my screen, but hopefully you can see me. Um, one thing I was going to mention to start with, just listening to what Stephen was saying on wrongful trading, was in relation to notifiable events uh, to Oscar. Stephen and I had a discussion with Oscar on this the other day. Oscar put some really helpful guidance on their website around COVID-19 and what they're saying about the notifiable events regime just now, which hopefully you know what that is, but basically if there's something that's putting your charity on a cliff edge, something really severe, 
which could be at the moment finances that you just don't think you're going to be able to continue, you're maybe not getting funding from the third sector resilience fund, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, at the moment they're saying don't put coming and telling us at the top of your list. It's not actually a legal requirement. Don't put it at the top of your list. Take your time. Do some good quality decision making. So that's what the guidance says. Um, interestingly though, someone from Oscar was mentioning that they would still be quite interested to hear about it, just a short email, because I think they can use some of that information to get a sense of what's happening in the sector and feed into wider discussions perhaps with um, Scottish Government, etc. And also um, SCBO's coronavirus hub pages are absolutely, they're a fantastic source of information just now. Can I just check, Stephen, can you give me a thumbs up? Can you see me properly? Because I'm still seeing you big on my screen. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I rashly said that I would talk a little bit about the job retention scheme. Massive caveat, I am not an employment solicitor, so cannot answer even the most basic questions on this, never mind technical ones. But the reason I wanted to mention it was because we are having, or we're experiencing quite a number of queries on this from charities really, I think, looking to be good employers, looking to make a top up. So where staff have agreed to be furloughed, rather than them just getting their 80% covered by the government, some charities are saying, well, can we give a top up of 10 or 20%? And actually, south of the border, there's a form that the Charity Commission would actually expect you to fill in where you're making a payment of this nature, a payment which a charity isn't legally obliged to make and which isn't really in furtherance of your charitable purposes. If staff have agreed to be furloughed rather than being made redundant, they've agreed it, end of, there isn't an obligation to pay anything further. Um, it really comes down to, a bit like, remember my dad sitting on the children's panel years ago, what was paramount was what is in the interest of the child. Kind of the same with charities, what is in the best interest of the charity has to always be your mantra if you're sitting on the board of a charity. You would really need to be able to demonstrate convincingly and as a board come to collective decision that making a top up was in the best interest of the charity. I'll possibly pick up with SDBO separately to see if they've got any information on this in terms of the charity sector wide position. I understand from my employment colleagues that across the Scottish business sector, it's not actually the norm to make a top up. So in order to be able to say, yeah, this was really in the best interest of the charity, you'd need to have a convincing argument such as, well, the people that we've got have got really specialist skills. They are top notch. If we don't make this top up, they'll feel really disenfranchised, really demoralized. And when things start to pick up, they'll be off. We'll have lost the base people. It's not going to be easy to find other people. And I don't know how convincing that argument would be at the moment, because what we're hearing is that there will be chronic um, shortages of job opportunities, that once furlough is um, once furlough is uh, ceased, that there will be a lot of redundancy. So I think people will be clinging on to their jobs um, for all their worth, and that actually people will be clambering over themselves to, to get any jobs that are available. So I can understand the desire of charities to be good employers, but like I say, case by case basis, there would need to be something really, really convincing um, for you to be able to come to that decision that it's in the, the interest of the charity. Rona, are there any specific questions on that, which I've kind of fired out there very quickly. And as I say, um, I don't actually, um, <laughs> I don't really have the ability to answer specific job retention queries. There's nothing, nothing yet. Okay, thank you. So, mergers, uh, I've only got 10 minutes to speak on this, which might be a bit of a challenge. Um, why am I even bothering to speak about mergers? You might be asking, well, especially given what Stephen was saying earlier on about wrongful trading and about the government's desire, both the Scottish government and the UK government, to keep you going. Um, you've got the job retention scheme, we've got the Third Sector Resilience Fund, we've got various um, concessions being allowed for by the government. Um, yeah, at the moment the focus is on keep on going, keep doing what you're doing with a view to survival, but actually, ultimately, it would be a bit naive not to think that there won't be an upturn 
in the number of mergers in the Scottish charity sector as a response to COVID-19. Ultimately, furlough will be removed, some of the funds will dry up. And to keep on limping on and focusing on the independence of your charity, retaining your independent status might not be what's ultimately in the interest of your the interest of your beneficiaries, your service users. And again, once the wrongful trading suspension is lifted, there is that flip to what's in the interest of the creditors rather than in your service users. So I think we just need to be aware of it, have it on the horizon and start to be looking at what other organisations are there out there where you think there might be a synergy, where you think that by working with them, you could actually create something that's uh, where the sum is greater than the, the individual parts, whether it's a geographical thing, you're a Glasgow-based charity, there's a really credible Edinburgh-based charity with a similar mission, a similar cultural feel, whether it's north and south of the border. If you are a mental health-based charity, but your focus is solely on working with people who have addiction issues and their mental health problems flow from that, are you kind of looking at the horizon and thinking, we think funding for this isn't really going to be as widely available. The focus is going to be on mental health issues more broadly, not just linked to substance abuse, because what we're hearing about lockdown is that mental health issues are going to be um, massive. So you might be thinking, is there an organisation that's got a broader remit in terms of mental health and we think we could bring something specialist to that? So I think it's just having that at the back of your head and it's far better, I would say, that you are thinking about this and you're starting to have quite critical conversations with people rather than being forced down this route by funders, by local authorities, cutting back on funding and services contracts. Because when it's forced, that's when it has the potential to go spectacularly wrong. So very basic terms, I'm going to take you through the key components of what's involved in a merger so as to demystify it, because people tend to think, oh, it's a dirty word, we don't want our organisation to be subsumed. People also think, oh, it's very corporate finance, it's all very legal. Sometimes it is, that depends on how it's approached. It needn't be um, quite as hideous as that. So when I talk about a merger, I'm really just talking about two or more organisations coming together to form one. Key, key thing in all of this is dialogue and communication and being as open as you can with the organisations you're speaking to. Sometimes we see people being asked to sign non-disclosure agreements um, in the context of early merger discussions. If you really feel that's necessary and you feel that it will give you the confidence to disclose information about how your organisation works, fair enough. It's not something I would personally push. I think it is too much of a corporate finance approach and it does tend to overly lawyer things and I don't technically think it's necessary. Um, less is more sometimes. So I would also advocate as part of this dialogue, setting up some sort of joint steering group, just an informal grouping at the outset, your organization, the other organization or organizations that you're speaking to, to have all the discussions and share information. Um, key advantages, it can preserve the work that you're currently doing with your beneficiaries, whereas if funding is running out, things are getting closer and closer to the bone and you are getting to that cliff edge, that really valuable work could disappear, whereas there's protection in forming something bigger um, and also administration cuts, uh, costs are cut, back office um, facility costs are reduced, um, increasing purchasing power, um, it, th there are a lot of cost efficiencies. Disadvantages, one of the key disadvantages at the outset is it's quite costly to do it. Um, and sadly, you would be paying people like me to do it because it is one of the few areas where I would say that you do need a lawyer to help with this. Stephen and the team here, we've done a lot of work in developing free resources for charities, most of them available through SCBO, some available through Development Trust Association, but merger is one where you really do need legal advice. Um, the other main disadvantage is there is not an easy out. There's no easy exit strategy. Once you have merged into another organization, if you are, if you were the chief exec of the smaller organization and you go into the bigger one. So if we think about the substance abuse one, <clears throat> if you've joined with this 
charity who has a broader focus in mental health, then all of a sudden you've moved over and you're saying, well, wait a minute, you seem to be focusing on mental health issues for young people. But what we were doing in Glasgow around substance abuse, that's mainly affecting middle-aged people and that's just gone. So you've had a loss of mission, poor cultural fit. You, as that former CEO, don't have any right to pull it back out. If you go to the board, that board is managing the merged organisation and their duty is to act in the interests of the merged entity. Um, so that, that unfortunately um, is the main disadvantage. It is a bit of a one-way street. So what does the process look like? I've said have dialogue. It all sounds very fluffy and nice. Um, do a feasibility study and outline business case for your board, for both boards saying, well, why do we think this would, would work best? What, what is this going to look like? Due diligence is a biggie as well. You can use lawyers for this, um, but it can be very, very costly and there's a lot you can do yourselves. Due diligence really just means doing your homework on the party that you're proposing to merge with. So looking for skeletons in the closet, what liabilities does this organisation have? So if you are organisation B over here and you're going to take all the assets and operations of organisation A, you want to know exactly what's fitting over here. What liabilities might crop up that are going to become yours post-merger? So you want to be looking at uh, terms and conditions of employees, the pension position, major contracts, service delivery contracts, grant funding agreements, any clawback provisions in there. So it's really important for this organisation, the one that's taking it over, but it's also really important for the one that's going to disappear. This is ridiculous that I keep doing this with my hands. But the one that's um, going to disappear because, again, if we go back to the substance abuse one, if you've given everything away to this other organisation and they've got some huge clawback issue under the grant funding agreement, and they disappear two weeks after you've transferred, well, then your service users are really not in a, a good position. So you do your outline business case, your due diligence. There will be some statutory consents that are needed as well. So Oscar will need to give consent to what's being proposed, predominantly consent for the transferring charity to ultimately be wound up once it's transferred its assets over. But the one over here, the bigger mental health charity, it might also change its name to reflect uh, more closely what the merged organisation is doing. It might have to change its objects to refer to sub uh, addiction and substance abuse. It might also change um, the structure at board level to allow for people to come over from the transferring organisation. You might include reference to a special committee structure under the, the, say the articles or the SCIO constitution of the the organisation that will continue in existence to make reference to say substance abuse. So it gives a little bit of comfort to the organisation that's disappearing that some of what they did will be enshrined in the constitution. Or if you had a Scottish organisation merging into a UK one, you might have reference to a specialist Scottish committee. Sorry, I can hear my children shouting in the background, so you possibly can too. Once you've got your consent from Oscar, there are various resolutions that would need to be passed by the members of both of the entities potentially. So the one that's transferring needs to pass a special resolution saying we can transfer everything over here and then be wound up. So that's a special resolution of the members of that organisation. Rona will probably nods when I say if we had a pounder every time we've been told we don't have members, we've just got directors. They may be one and the same people, but you do have members, has to be documented as a resolution of the members. Similarly, wider mental health charity, special resolution of the members if there's to be any change of name, change of objects, change to the constitution. And then the main bit that we get involved in, as well as helping with the resolutions and the Oscar consent, is the transfer agreement, um, which is basically saying we agree to transfer everything to you. And we're not going to, we accept that we're not going to be paid for it. So no money comes from the big mental health charity to the smaller addiction-based one for the transfer of assets and operations. But the payoff for that is that, they're really noisy in the background, is that this organization that will be continuing will say, we will indemnify the board of the transferring one so that if there are any liabilities that crop up after the transfer date that were referable to when you 
we're responsible for things. We're not going to come after you. We pick up the tab for that. And this is such, such a critical point in mergers and one that quite often we have a bit of a bun fight with other lawyers over if it's lawyers who do not know this sector especially if it's corporate finance lawyers, this is just unheard of to them. Why on earth would we indemnify this lot? Well, it's very clear. This lot here, they've given away everything for no payment. So if this company's been cleaned out and a liability crops up later, the board of this lot theoretically have personal liability. So it's really for you over here to do your homework, do your due diligence. That's where you get comfort and all of this. And then in parallel with getting the transfer agreement negotiated and signed, you've got Shoopy consultations, you're looking at your various contracts with third parties and leases and getting consent to transfer all of those, because unfortunately these things don't just automatically transfer with the transfer agreement being signed, there's a bit more that needs done to them. And most of the contractual stuff you can do yourselves without lawyers, but for leases um, you would need the advice of a property lawyer. So very quickly, how would you actually structure it? Oh, I've drawn a wonderful diagram here. I don't even know if you can see that. Can you see it? Here is option one, which is very faint. So it's not really a proper merger. We set up a new entity, but it's a bit of a shell. It doesn't really do anything. And then we take the big mental health charity and the little addiction one, and we make them subsidiaries of this one up here. So there are some cost savings. You can have some back office services sitting up here. The reason for doing this, though, is it avoids kind of sensitivities. If people are a bit nervous about a full-blown merger, it allows you to keep two separate boards, a bit of independence, but being bound by sort of overall kind of uh, group policies and things like that. It's also relatively cheap because you're not actually transferring anything, but it's not really a merger. It's sort of dipping a toe in. Um, the sort of merger pool and the likelihood is that X number of years down the line you'll be told to merge anyway because um, it doesn't really achieve in terms of financials. The second one is where you, if we look at my stellar diagram again, we imagine that again this is a new company but this time instead of setting up subsidiaries, both charities transfer into that and then both of those charities cease to exist. Very costly two sets of transfers plus setting up a new entity. I think it's incredibly unlikely that we'll see any of those anytime soon. We don't tend to see them anyway. Again, it's to avoid sensitivities around one feeling they've been subsumed by another. So maybe if you've got two similar sized charities and there's a bit of an argy-bargy, you might see it there. By far the most common is you have one <laughs> transferring over to another. Gosh, I'm embarrassed. My son can do better than this, and he's six. Um, one transferring over to another, and the decision on which will continue to exist and which will cease to exist is based pretty much on cost. So you do, as part of your due diligence, a list of all the assets that each has, um, and you're looking at which would be the most costly to transfer things out of, and that's the one that remains. Pensions is huge in this. Pensions can be the deciding factor. And again, please don't ask me questions on pensions. I'm not a pensions lawyer. But I think the main issue can be if one entity has staff who've come from local government and who are in the local government pension scheme, there can be a crystallization of liability on transferring them out um, to be transfer. So that can be a deciding factor. You're also looking at properties that either of the two entities own physical buildings, uh, what lease arrangements have they got, if one's got three leases, if one's only got one, it's obviously more costly to assign three leases, three lots of lawyers' fees. So it, it normally comes down to, to cost. So, wow, I did that in 10 to 15 minutes. That's what mergers look like. Um, I am not advocating them. I am neutral on this. I'm just saying don't totally head for the hills, you know, have it um, as part of your scenario planning for everything that you're looking at. Start to scan the horizon for people that you could potentially scale up with. Um, I guess something as a precursor to this would be forming consortia, but there's a lot involved in that. Um, but yeah, just be aware of it. The process itself, if you've got the right advice, is not uh, is not truly hideous, but it comes down to personalities and people having 
appropriate discussions. Rona, are there any questions? Yes, we've got two questions, both on the furlough scheme. One I don't think we'll be able to answer. We'll probably need to follow up um, later. Uh, yeah, so it's just about um, if uh, charities agreed uh, a full top up um, and things obviously then change later down the line, um, depending on how long this goes on for. Um, if they want to reduce that top up, do um, you need to get the employees agreement to that? But I think that's something that we'll need to all I know on that is that you do need the employees' agreement to okay, vote sure. in the first place. So, and I think I don't know that it's technically a change to contract. I know that there is some kind of letter goes out, but you do need to formally agree to it. So, potentially, yes, we will check with some unemployment. Yes, I would I imagine potentially you would need agreement, but the alternative is redundancy, presumably. But huge caveat, don't know, not an employment lawyer. Okay, we'll follow up on that. The other one is just, um, do we think that Oscar may question a 20% top-up or, or any top-up, as opposed to the furlough scheme in the future? Oscar will see, oh, seek legal advice. I think they will say <laughs> this isn't really for us to opine on this. And it's more likely that if someone complained to Oscar, if say a member of the board who hadn't agreed with this or say something say it looked as if the charity was going to get into trouble financially and someone was disgruntled and went to Oscar as a as a whistleblower, that's more likely where it would come up and then they would possibly say, Oh well, you know, difficult times, people were being called upon to make difficult decisions. But I think if they were being responsible about it, they would look into it um, in more detail. And technically speaking, if they're doing an investigation, they would look at all your minutes, they would look at all the decision making, they would speak to individual board members and find out, well, what was your involvement in this? Why? What was your understanding of why the, the decision was made? Um, yeah, there, there have been things like this that have been done in the past where charities have made sort of payouts to people who were being made redundant that they didn't really have to make. Um, and some of them have hit the papers at times and not been very pleasant. So, and that was at a time when Oscar really didn't see as much of that, but we're still prepared to opine on it. So I think it is one where you do need to be careful. Um, that's all the questions. They all uh, so there's just one more question that's come in. It said, so would you say it's not good governance to top up the furlough? Uh, I think cannot possibly say without knowing <laughs> on a case by case basis, but I think at the moment it's um, you need to have a very convincing argument as to why you've done it, and it would depend on the sector you're in, the ease of getting the sorts of people that you've got in those positions in the future. I think that's us. That's all the questions that have come in. Well, thank you very much. Sorry, we've gone slightly over everyone, um, but we're, we're really grateful for your involvement today. And if you do have any specific queries that we feel that haven't been answered, Hopefully our email address has appeared on some kind of slide somewhere, but if not, um, you can find us all on the Burnus Paul website. Um, on, I'm on LinkedIn as well, if anyone wanted to send me a message on LinkedIn instead. And we will try our very best to answer your queries. Also, we um, are part of the pro bono service um, through SPBO, so you could contact SPBO if you're a member there and be put through to us in that way as well. So thank you very much for your time and we'll keep you posted with other blogs and everything else. Thank you.